Okay, so welcome uh, to the last uh, Colkin seminar of this year. And our speaker is Colin Favachon, and he'll talk about Mahler's method in several variables. Thank you very much for um, inviting me today. So um, my goal in this talk is to introduce you um, this uh, method of transonance, which is called Mahler's method in several variables. So we are going to to see which kind of result we can obtain with this method. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about one consequence of uh, these results about the expansions of uh, real numbers in integer bases. So let, let us first start with a few definitions. Um, so I, I will back you to denote the, the field of algebraic numbers in all in all the talk. If Q uh, is an integer greater than or equal to two, um, a power series with algebraic coefficients is uh, is called an MQ function if it is a solution of an equation of of this form. Okay. So this is a um, a linear equation. A linear relation between f, f of z to the power of q, f of z to the power of q to the power of two, and etc. Okay, so uh, this is a linear relation, and we we suppose there the um, the ai the the coefficients to be polynomials with, with algebraic coefficients, and we can also suppose that the extremal coefficients are not zero. It's well, it's not really a restriction there. So this is what we call an MQ function, and we also call that a name function uh, if it is an MQ function for some uh, for some integer Q. There, the the letter M refers to the the ma mathematician Kurt Mahler, Mahler uh, who was the first to to study the the values of these functions at algebraic points, and he's also the the one who gave uh, his name to the 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 method the, the transcendence method we 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 are going to study today so sometimes they are called matter functions I, I will call them m function in in, in this talk okay so just beginning with um two examples of m functions so that we can see uh, what is an m function like if you consider for example this infinite product you can check that it converges as, as a power series uh, and that it, it has um, algebraic coefficients. Well, it, its coefficients are zero or, or one there. And it satisfies the following um, equation on, on the right there. Um, because when you put z to the power of q in, in the infinite product, it just shifts the, the product and it make it start with n equal to one uh, instead of zero. So, so you have this relation between f z and f of z to the power of q. So this is uh, an mq function and here m is equal to one in this example. So th this series is called the, the tumor series when uh, q is equal to two. Quite a, a, famous, uh, a famous power series in this field. Another Example, another simple one too. Um, are this sum, this, this series, so the sum of the z to the power of q to the power of n, sum over the integers, the non negative integers. And well, you can check quite easily that it satisfies this inhomogeneous equation between gz and g of z to the power of q for the same reason, because when you put z to the power of q in g, uh, it just shifts the sum there, so you you obtain that when you take the difference. But when you have uh, an inhomogeneous equation like that, you can always transform it in, into a homogeneous one, uh, like the one at the bottom of, of the slide. And in this case, m is equal to 2 when you, you look at the homogeneous equation. The series, the, the g, they are called the Fred Holm series. There are two examples of the functions we are going to study today. And well, I will give a few families, general fam families of functions, so that one can represent what, what is an M function. So first, the rational functions, uh, the one with no pole at zero, 
such that b is not zero uh, at zero are uh, m functions because you can check that it they satisfy the following uh, equation over there. So it's it's not hard to check that the rational functions are m functions. They are not the in interesting one. Um, more more uh, a larger family are the infinite Q Mahler products. Um, so like the two more uh, last like our first example, if you take R to be a rational function, but for which um, R of zero is equal to one, then this uh, infinite product uh, over the non-negative integers. It converges as a power series, and thus it defines an MQ function um, with m equal to one. So it's not that difficult to see uh, for this infinite project. Well, the, the, this is a larger class of um, m function, but an even more in interesting family are the, um, the generating series of Q automatic sequences. So I will define properly uh, Q automatic sequences later in the last part of the talk, because this is um, uh, the kind of um, sequence on which we, we're going to see an application. But I, I just give an example there of a two automatic sequence. This, this is called the, the bond switch sequence, and, and, and this is defined as follows. Uh, you let a n be 1 if in the binary expansion of the integer n, there is no blocks of consecutive zeros with odd length. This means that if you got some uh, blocks of consecutive zeros in the binary expansions of n, they have to be they have to have an even length. Else, you put a n to be zero. So this sequence with a term. A n is a sequence of zero and of ones. And if you take its uh, generating series, well, there's a theorem saying that is in a, it is an, M, an M2 function. Okay. And more generally, all the sequences that can be obtained with similar process as the bomb switch sequence, um, well, they are called uh, automatic sequences and they, they give uh, rise to M function. So that this will be a, a large family of uh, M functions that, that, that are going to be really useful in this talk. I would like also uh, to give some properties of M functions so that um, well, we can have a better idea of um, what, has they, what are these functions. So first note that um, the products and the sum of two MQ functions is an MQ function. So that's the, the set of MQ functions is a ring. But actually, it is not true anymore if, if you remove the subscribed Q uh, in the first sentence of the, the property. Because well, if you take an M2 function uh, and an M3 function and you make the sum of them, for example, it is not in general uh, an M function. So well, this first sentence is true if, if you, you look at, at MQ function with a, a fixed Q. Okay. Uh, a really important and interesting properties of M function is the, the second one there, which is from uh, Rounde, which says the following, that an irrational M function is meromorphic inside the unit disk. This means that um, it may have singularities in the unit disk, but all the singularities are polar ones. Okay. In particular, since it is um, a power series, it is analytic it, in some neighborhood of zero. And well, um, it is meromorphic inside the unit disk. So only polar singularities in, in, inside the unit disk. But the unit circle is a nat natural boundary. And this means that ne uh, nowhere in the unit circle, you can uh, continue the um, you can continue the, the the power series. There is no analytic continuation nowhere in 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 the unit circle. So this is really interesting because it excludes uh, really many fun functions from being n functions. For example, the exponential function cannot be a, an n function. 
because it is uh, well analytic in in over C, but many of the functions log of one minus Z is not an M function neither. Um, lots of functions are excluded from being M functions because of this uh, property there. Okay, and in particular, if you got an algebraic irrational function, power series, it cannot be an M function because um, algebraic uh, functions only have a finite number of singularities. So they cannot have the unicircle as natural boundary. So an M function is either, uh, is either a rational function like in the first family there, or it is a transcendental function. Uh, we, could, we could even prove that, well, this is a, a, mo a more recent theorem that M functions are, are hyper-transcendental which means that they are not solutions of um, algebra differential. Sorry, that was my cat. They are not solutions of algebra differential equations. Okay. So that that also excludes a, a large um, number of functions from, from being M functions. Okay. And I will just note a last property, which is quite important when you do arithmetic with M functions. It's that their coefficients, uh, who are supposed to be uh, algebraic numbers, they in fact span a finite extension of a cube. So they all lie in, the, in a fixed uh, number field. OK, so I will start with um, one question, which is, um, what can we do if you take uh, one value of an M function at some algebraic points, and this is Mala's method in, in one variable who is gonna give uh, an answer. So the setting is the following. Oh, we, we have this transcendence theorem. We, we say the following, if, if you take F to be an M function, and which is defined of an, a number field, uh, say K, and you want to, to take the value of f at some algebraic point alpha. So you take alpha to be not zero, but to be in the unit disk. Uh, otherwise, it's not defined. Then three things may happen. Either alpha is a pole of f, uh, which is possible. Either f of alpha being uh, belongs to the, to the ground field, the field where everything is defined. So the field K of alpha, or if it doesn't belong to K of alpha, then it is transcendental. So this says that it, the value of an M function can, may be uh, an algebraic number, but if it is so, it belongs to the, um, to the small field where everything is defined, the, the field K of alpha, okay? So this, this is a, a result uh, w w which give a satisfactory an answer and we, we cannot rule out any of these, these three uh, possibilities. Um, well, as I show in the, in the following example, for if you take, for example, this infinite product there, so it's uh, a rational uh, fraction that you, you take a, an infinite product there, then we have seen that it is an M3 function, but one over five um, is clearly a, a pole of f because it's a zero of the, the denominator there. One over two is a zero of f. So it belongs to the, the small field uh, k of alpha, which there is just q. And uh, you could prove that one over 10 is a transcendental value of f. f of one over 10 is a transcendental number. Uh, I, I won't prove it there, but you could prove that. So the, the three possibilities uh, happen in this ex example, okay? But what is quite satisfactory with this uh, result is that you have, um, we have a, an algorithm to, to decide between the three possibilities. Um, so which said, okay, you, you give me a function, you an M function, that is, you, you give me the, its equation and a certain number of coefficients. 
you give me an algebraic number and I can, can tell you, uh, well, if the value is defined, but if it is transcendental or, or if it belongs to the, the small field there. So this kind of um, solve the question of the transcendence for the, the values of one M function. So now that we we answer this question, another question arises is what happens when you consider when you consider several values of um, M functions. Uh, the first uh, the first uh, case is where when you have several values, but they are all coming from uh, MQ functions with the same Q. And they are all values of this, the functions at the same points, the same algebraic points, alpha. And you, you ask, well, what can I say of the algebraic relation between these R numbers, F1 of alpha to FR or alpha, and, de and there F1 to FR are, are MQ function, but with the same Q, the, the R with the same Q. Well, in this setting, we have um, an answer that I could um, summarize a, as follow. That's any algebraic relation between these R values has a functional origin. So there, there may be some algebraic relation between such values, but they all come from uh, some functional relation. And well, I, I I have to precise there what I mean by functional origin. I, I won't give a, um, a, a really precise statement, but I, I will give an example so that we can uh, represent what it means. For example, take, take this function f, which is z plus uh, an infinite product there. And you have at one over two, you have uh, this relation. That is f one over two is equal to one over two because the uh, infinite product just dis just vanishes at one over two. So you can see that as a relation between the function f and the identity function z at the point so one over two. Well, we can see it as as a linear relation. Okay, but there is a functional ex explanation of this relation, which is the following. Uh, there is a relation between f of z, between z and f of z to the power of three, which is the following one. We could check that this relation exists. And when you specialize this, this relation at one over two, you see that the term, the term in f of z to the power of three, it disappears. So what, what only remains when specializing, it's just f of one over two minus one over two is equal to, to zero. So this is the kind of functional origin uh, I mean when I write functional origin. This means that every time you have an algebraic relation between such numbers, there is some uh, functional relation between the, the, the functions at stake and not only the functions, but also their images uh, under the map uh, z to the, z maps to z to the power of q and the iterates of, of this map. So, well, this this give this gives at least an answer um, when you study the algebraic relations between um, such numbers. But of course, you have to to understand the functional origin, and this is a quite a a difficult thing to do in, in, gen in general. This is the object of uh, the Galois theory of, um, of matter equations, OK? But another case uh, that we will talk about uh, is when you consider now some values but coming from a MQ function associated to distinct integer Qs. Or to M function, but uh, the values at some algebraic points alpha that may be, uh, you may take dif distinct uh, algebraic points alpha. I. So this is a new, a whole new setting that we are talking about. Then now you take some MQI functions, but with some, some in integer Q1 to QR that might be uh, distinct. 
or might not be distinct, but you allow them to be distinct integers. And you also take R algebraic numbers, alpha one to alpha R, and you also allow them to be um, to be distinct, okay? The, well, the, the hypothesis is that they are not zero and they are not poles of the FI so that you can consider the value of FI at alpha, I, okay? Yeah. I uh, let theta i to denote this this value, and the question now, well, well, it's the same. It's what can be said about the algebraic relations between these numbers. So this is a new settings. This is a new setting because the well, the qi might be distinct, as I say, and the alpha i might be distinct. So you we cannot use the the results. Um, we obtained previously with Malas method in, in one variable. We we can we cannot use the, the previous uh, results. But uh, since we do have the the previous result with one Q and one alpha, we are able to uh, to make some restrictions. The first one is that we can exclude the case where Q1 is equal to Q2, alpha one is equal to alpha two, and if one is equal to F2, because well, in this case, uh, just uh, zeta one is, is zeta two, and it's not really in interesting. So we can exclude this case, but we can also exclude the case where all the Q i i equal and all the alpha i, I equal, because this just would be the um, results from the previous parts from Mal's method in, in one variable. So I will exclude this case and see what we, we can say about uh, the algebraic relation. And then with uh, Boris Adamczewski, we obtained this uh, general algebraic independence theorem. Okay, that I, I, I will that I will comment. It says the following: uh, If you suppose that either the QI, so Q1 to QR are pairwise multiplicatively independent. I, I, I put the definition there, I, I will come back to it later. You suppose either that, uh, or that you, you do not, sup or you not, do not suppose everything on anything on the QI, but you suppose that the alpha i are multiplicatively independent. Then if you are in one of these case, you obtain the, the following uh, result that if, each value is transcendental, then all the values are algebraically independent. So this is quite, um, well, this is quite a, a powerful theorem because you just have to prove the trans transcendence of some, of some values to obtain the algebraic independence. And uh, in particular, you don't have to suppose anything on the functions. So we don't suppose there the, the functions to be algebraically independent. We obtain the algebraic independence of the values without uh, supposing anything about the, the relations the relations between the functions, okay? So uh, I give two examples. Uh, well, consider these two uh, infinite products, okay? F, uh, F is an M2 function and G is an M3 function. Mm, then, if you take Q1 equal to Q2 and F1 equal to F2 equal to F, you take alpha 1 equal to 1 over 2 and alpha 2 equal, equal to 1 over 10, then the second assumption there is satisfied because, because 1 over 2 and 1 over 10 are multiplicatively independent with this definition. Then it follows from this theorem that um, if you can prove these two values are transcendental, then they are algebraically independent. And actually, we can prove that they are transcendental values with the first uh, uh, theorem. That with the transcendence theorem, we, we can prove individually that these values are transcendental. And then it follows from this theorem that they are algebraically independent. Okay. So the same function, two distinct points, and we obtain the algebraic independence. And the second case is if you take f to some points alpha and g to some points beta, algebraic alpha and beta, 
we don't suppose anything on alpha and beta, uh, but that they are, they are non-zero. But in this case, you have Q1, which is equal to two, and Q2, which is equal to three. And since two and three are multiplicatively independent, we are in this situation, and it follows that um, if f alpha and g beta are transcendental, then these two values are algebraically independent. Well, we can prove that f, f alpha and g beta are transcendental uh, numbers for every non-zero alpha and beta. So we obtain the algebraic independence uh, there, okay? I, I recall that alpha and beta are inside the unit circle, so they cannot be one, for example, because okay, the product cannot be zero there. But it's quite um, powerful there because we can you can take any alpha beta. So in particular, you could take um, alpha to be equal to beta, and you would obtain that f alpha and g alpha are algebraically independent. And you could uh, conclude that f of z and g of z as functions are algebraically independent of a qz. So we can obtain from this theorem uh, some algebraic independence between um, between uh, m functions. And well, this is basically just because f is an m2 function and g is an m3 function. And we can see how, how we can deduce from uh, this kind of results that if you got, if you have two transcendental functions, but the one is an, an MQ function, an, an MQ1 function, and the, the second is an MQ2 function with Q1 and Q2 uh, multiplicatively independent, we can obtain with a, a, a similar reasoning the algebraic independence of these two functions. So this is a, the algebraic independence result we have, okay? Um, well, I wanted to say a few words about uh, the proof, but I'm going to be a little bit short. So I'm going to uh, go into the application and I, like go back to, to this slide if I, I have time uh, later, OK? Because I, I really want to, to talk about um, this application, about the expansion of, of real numbers. So we, well, it's a new start. So you, you consider the... Um, the B expansion of a real number between zero and one as being the unique uh, sequence of I, 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 such that zeta is the sum of I, I, A, I, uh, B to the power of minus I, and A, I uh, are integer between zero and B minus one, okay? And you suppose that uh, the A, I are distant from B minus one for infinitely many I. This guarantees that, um, the expansion is unique, okay? So such an expansion always exists. And you have, for example, that um, if zeta is rational, then uh, the B expansion is, ultima is ultimately periodic for some B, which is equivalent as being uh, ultimately periodic for uh, every B. And this is equivalent to uh, as being a rational number. So, um, well, the, the question of big, big expansion of uh, rational numbers is a simple question, but the the study, well, the, the B expansion of uh, irrational numbers, uh, classical uh, irrational numbers, such, such as uh, square root of two, pi, uh, log of three, uh, and, and many others, it's much more, well, we do know really few about this uh, expansion. We, we know, know some things, but, there are still a lot we don't know. Uh, for example, we don't know um, if there's infinitely many ones in the decimal expansion of uh, square root of two uh, or of, of pi. Well, there are lo lots of questions. But another thing which is a sort of source of mystery, mystery, it's what happens when you change of basis, uh, for example. Take this uh, irrational number chi, uh, irrational because its binary expansion is not uh, periodic. It's not periodic because it has a one exactly at the digit uh, whose position is a power of three, okay? Because of the definition of chi. 
So it's just the binary expansion is uh, most of the dig digits are, are zeros, but there is a one uh, in the power of uh, at the position which uh, which are power of three. So at one, at three, at nine, at uh, twenty seven, at eighty one, etc. Okay. So it's been it's binary expansion. It's quite uh, easy to describe to explain. But what can we say of its decimal expansion? I wrote there the, the beginning. Well, at first sight, there is nothing um, uh, obvious to, to describe uh, at least the beginning of the, the decimal expansion. And well, there is this, um, this, this belief that if um, the expansion of an irrational number is quite simple in some uh, integer bases, then it, it would be um, in most other uh, integer bases, it, it would be quite uh, complicated in, actually. It's a, a heuristic uh, that I could um, tell us follow that the expansion of uh, an irrational number in two, uh, well, multiplicatively independent bases, if you take there's two expansions, so you have two sequences. Well, when you compare these two sequences, they should, they are expected not to have any common structures. So this is a heuristic and we have to get things more precise, but this, this will be in a moment. Just a few, uh, just I say multiplicatively independent bases because uh, it's not difficult to pass from a, uh, a basis to a multiplicatively dependent one. For example, you can uh, go from the binary expansion to the base four expansion by uh, grouping each um, block of two digits. Okay, and when you have two consecutive zero, but you say it's a zero in base four. When you got a zero one, it's a one in base four. When when you got a one zero, it's a, it's a two in base four. And, and when you got two ones. It's a free in base four. Okay, so going from multi from a basis to a multiplicatively dependent one is is not so difficult. But what which what is difficult is to go from a basis to a multiplicatively independent. And in this setting, uh, Furstenberg in the seventies uh, states a really nice uh, conjecture to capture the the, the heuristic I, I gave. So he says the following, uh, consider, given a real number zeta, consider the, the fact of um, shifting its big, its big expansion of uh, one rank to the, to the left. So you, you, you shift the big expansion, that, that's, that's what the, the map do, and you repeatedly um, do that. So you, you, you look at, at all the real number you obtain by, by doing so, okay? by just uh, successively shifting the, the B expansion of zeta from uh, one rank and, and from one more rank. And you forgot for, you forget the, the inte integer parts. So you, you just keep the, the fractional part of the real number. So you obtain a set which, which is called the orbit of zeta, the B orbit of zeta, which is uh, between zero and one. And well, it's finite if and only if the zeta is rational and, and then it's B expansion is uh, is ultimately per periodic, but it's infinite else. And Furstenberg conjectured the following, that if you take um, the Holzdorf dimension of the orbits of a, an irrational number, irrational number zeta in two multiplicatively independent bases, and if, if you sum these dimensions, then the sum is greater than or equal to one. Uh, which may, which means, for example, the following: that if you had uh, the the host of dimension of the orbit, uh, which is zero in some bias b one, which which would mean, for example, that well, the b one expansion is quite simple. There there was there are not too many um, um, well too many. The, the B1 expansion is quite simple because of that, because of the uh, host of dimension that is zero, then in, here, in in every other multiplicatively independent basis, you would have the dimension that is 
equal to one. That is the maximum because the host of dimension in is of some subset of zero one is uh, at most one. Okay. So this conjecture is out of reach for for now, but it has been proved by by Smirkin and Vu that it holds outside um, a set of exception which has a host of, dimen a host of dimen dimension equal to zero. So this set of exception of, of uh, this conjecture is a set with host of dimension zero. But unfortunately, this done, the result from making and view does not say anything about uh, this consequence of Fassenberg conjecture because, um, well, the sets of all uh, real numbers whose host of di dimension in some base is zero uh, is a zero dimensional set. So, well, Schmerkin and Vu's result does not say anything about uh, these consequences of uh, Fassenberg conjecture. Now, since uh, this is out of reach, we're going to narrow down the problem and uh, have a look at the algor algorithmic uh, point of view. So just recall that a real number is, is said to be computable if you can um, produce, produce its uh, B expansion for some for some B uh, with a Turing machine. And if you can do that for some B, you can do that for any B actually, okay? Well, this is this is a, a countable uh, set of real number, but for the real number that interest us, like uh, square root of two pi uh, e, they all are computable. Okay, most of the uh, useful uh, constant are computable numbers, but we're gonna restrict the the class of com computable number we are looking at, and we we're gonna have a look of automatic of automatic real numbers. So I will, I will explain um, what it is. Um, a deterministic finite automaton with output. So it's a Turing machine, but with a finite number of states. This one has three states, okay? And in our setting, it will read the um, an integer uh, written in base q. So th this there, it reads an uh, integer written in base 3. It, it is able to read some 0, some 1, and some, some 2. Okay. It starts in one state. This one starts in A. And each time it reads uh, digits, it, it uh, changes of state uh, according to a rule which depends only on the states it is in and on the digit it reads. Okay. So if it is in A and it reads a zero, it stays in A. If and if it reads a one, it goes in B, etc. Okay. And then it reads the another digit from the Q base of uh, the integer n, and it changes of state uh, according to what it reads, and etc. And it stops. It stops at the end of the reading of um, the base Q uh, expansion of n. Then when it stops, it is in a state, say it is in C, it writes down the, the integer corresponding to the state it is. So if, it, if it's in C, it writes down a zero. If it, if it stops in B, it writes down a one. So for example, this, uh, this DFI IO, it will write a one if and only if it uh, reads, it reads a, a power of three written in base three because uh, a power of three in base three is just a one and zero zero um, afterwards. So it starts in A, it reads a one, it goes in B, then it only reads zero, so it stays in B, and eventually it stops in B. Then it writes down a one, okay? And if it re reads anything else from a, a one and several zeros, then it will go uh, in C, and then it, it will write uh, down uh, a zero, OK? Well, if we go back to our number chi, which was the sum of the 2 to the power minus 3 to the power of k, then its binary expansion is produced by this automaton 
because, well, it's exactly a one at the power of three and a zero else, uh, as we said. So we can say that it is free automatic in basis two. Free automatic because this automaton reads uh, integers in base three and in basis two because it is the binary expansion of chi, okay. But it, is it automatic in base 10? That is, is there uh, a GFIO which is able to produce the sequence of uh, its 10 if its decimal expansion? Okay. Well, we can answer that, and the answer is no, because of the following consequence of our uh, algebraic independence result. And I just go quickly uh, with that. I think just two more minutes, if you allow me. Allow me. Um, if you let b1 and b2 be two multiplicatively independent integers, that, that's the setting, then if you have a real number, which is both automatic in base b1 and base b2, that is, there is an automaton that is able to produce its uh, b1 expansion, and there is another automaton which is able to produce its b2 expansion, then this number has to, has to be a rational number cannot be irrational if, if it is automatic in two multiplicatively independent bases. So uh, chi is not automatic in base 10 because chi is irrational and um, it is automatic in base two. So you cannot be in automatic in base 10. Well, this is a, a tiny step towards first omega conjecture because um, if a number is automatic in some base, then its host of dimension uh, of the orbit is zero, okay? But just give the proof because it's quite simple. Um, there, suppose that zeta is both automatic in base B1 and base B2. Then you take F to be the generating series of the B1 expansion and G to be the generating series of the B2 expansion. You, you got this there. This is the definition. But as generating series of automatic sequences, there are M functions. Now, one over B1 and one over B2 are multiplicatively independent because of the assumptions in the theorem. Thus, if zeta were transcendental, uh, this number would be transcendental, and then they will be algebraically independent uh, from our algebraic independence theorem. But this is absurd because they are equal. They cannot be algebraically independent. So zeta is not transcendental, the city is algebraic. But we have seen the first theorem that if um, a value of an M function is algebraic, then it belongs to the ground field, the field where everything is defined. But there, the ground field is just Q because um, one over B1 belongs to Q. And the generating series of uh, the B1 expansion is, uh, is defined over Q. So zeta belongs to Q, that is, it is a, a rational number. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you very much for, for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Colin, so much for this uh, really nice, uh, interesting talk. <clears throat> Do we have any questions or comments? Just unmute yourself and ask. You can also type in the chat if you prefer. Excuse me, you, um, could you... Go back. Uh, you have a bar over the orbit. Um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot what that means. The orbit of the um, okay. Over yeah. the well, the orbit is just um, defined there. So you take the rational number, you shift its b expansion from one one rung to the left, and you you forget from uh, you forget the integer part. So you get another uh, real number, which is a bit zeta, and you shifts once again the the b expansion of uh, this number of one rank you get a new um, uh, real number and you do that at the infinity of okay, you did that infinitely many times okay so you, you get infinitely many numbers there uh we I, I didn't talk about the bar actually it's, it's a just the closure the topological cl closure of uh, okay just topological closure oh, sorry okay. And you, you take the host of dimension, so I don't know if it's necessary that I okay. go into details there. But... I just want to see the... the, the, the just, just say a few words. If the, if the dimension, the host of dimension is one, 
Well, it's, it means that the set is uh, dense in zero, zero, 01. The orbit is dense. And it means in particular that you, that any sequence of uh, finite sequence of digits, uh, any possible finite sequence of digits appears in the B expansion of zeta. If the Hausdorff dimension is e of the orbit C is equal to one. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? So one thing I was wondering is about, so it, kind of early on in the doc, you mentioned this algorithm to decide whether or not the evaluation of an M function at uh, this uh, alpha is um, Russian, uh, yeah, it's, it's algebraic or transcendental. Can you say a little bit about this algorithm or what, what's the idea behind it? Like, like yeah. somehow, how complicated is it? What? It's not that complicated, uh, actually. The, um, the basic thing, if, well, you suppose you have um, a, a linear, you have a function that is, you have a, the linear equation, okay? And uh, what you what is quite easy to do is to compute the minimal uh, linear equation that uh, it is a solution uh, of. So the one with, um, if I go back in the first slide, the one with M uh, minimal, okay? Mm -hmm. But you uh, are not going to compute the minimal homoge homogeneous equation, but the minimal with a second term there, there, which is, uh, which is supposed to be, uh, which you, you allow to be uh, a polynomial too. So you compute the minimal in, in homogeneous equation. That is not difficult to do. Uh, there is not an why well, just solving a, a system uh, with coefficients in, 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 in bar Q, so this is easy. And then, well, this become just a bit technical. You, you can, um, because you, you have to avoid the singularities of the system, okay? But if you say in a first uh, place that this, the system uh, don't have any, any, any pole, then you just, when you get this minimal equation with a, a second term de there, it will just say that basically f alpha is algebraic if a1 of alpha, a2 of alpha, am of alpha are zero. And you just end up with a0 alpha f alpha equal to the second term there, which is not zero. Uh, what we, which can be not zero, okay? But what well, this is if there is no singularity um, apart from alpha, and else if if there are singularities, you can um, you can compute uh, in a power of alpha, an alpha to the power of q to the power of k for some integer k. So you you can compute a k such that alpha to the power of q to the power of k is not a singularity of the system. And you can do something similar, but by not looking at uh, the minimal equation for the, mini the minimal equation of F as an MQ function, but you look at the minimal equation of F as an MQ to the power of K function. Okay, mm -hmm. but well, this is a, a little difficulty, but it's not hard to do. It's, it's really effective as an, as an algorithm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so if there's no uh, more questions. Sorry, if I, if I can just ask a, a small one. Sure. Um, so uh, thank you, Colin, very much for the very nice talk. Uh, I, I've learned a lot. Um, you, you mentioned somewhere that uh, uh, there's this result about if you have several, um, I think, QML functions, uh, the Fs evaluated at alpha, uh, the relations between them come from functional relations amongst the Fs. Um, and you and you said that you didn't want to uh, delve into some technical definition of what you mean by functional relation, but I was hoping that you could say a little bit more. And in in particular, whether if the different f's are maybe interrelated by some differential equations, does this tell you something about the alphas? The the f's are the alphas, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I can tell a bit a little bit more. Actually, it's not that dif difficult to. Uh, well, you have to consider. Um, not only the um, ideal of relation between F1Z to FRZ, but 
you get to consider the um what well, this sigma algebraic relation where sigma mm -hmm. is the map z map maps to z, z to the power of q okay so uh once you got this uh, sigma ideal of uh, relation, you you can um, well you, you you can say that actually any relation between uh, this number come from specialization of sigma algebraic relation, but for which all the terms con uh, all the terms containing um, an image and the sigma of the of the initial uh, functions disappear at the point. So like in this example, so we see that we have more function, but this one vanishes there. Yeah, okay. So if you add uh, some differential relation between them, um, well, it would help you to understand the, the relation, the sigma, uh, the idea of sigma algebraic relation, especially because uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, commutation between uh, uh, the maps z maps to z to the power of q and the derivation, but well, it, it, it won't give the answer uh, immediately, but it, it will help. But the most difficult thing, difficult thing there is to understand the algebraic relation between uh, the functions, and. Well, there is a, a theoretical algorithm um, from Fang uh, to compute uh, algebraic, the, ide the sigma uh, ideal of algebraic relation, but it's not really effective uh, right now. Thank you. All right. So if there's uh, no more questions, then let's uh, thank Colin again for this really nice talk. And so this was the last talk uh, for this semester, in fact, for this year. But so we'll continue in next year, of course. And uh, yeah, you can see when on the homepage, once it's decided, but you'll also get this uh, an automated email once the, the date for the first uh, talk has been set. All right, so thank you. And I'm hoping to see you guys. Thank you very much. Next year then. All right, thanks, Colin.